Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome to Cantini. My name is Paul Herbert. I'm the director of the First Division Museum and it's my privilege to welcome you all uh, to this wonderful event in honor of uh, Black History Month. If you haven't been here to Cantini before, just a word of introduction. Uh, this is the historic estate of uh, the late Colonel Robert R. McCormick. He owned and published the Chicago Tribune uh, for nearly 50 years. Uh, and he lived here in Wheaton. His uh, historic home is about 500 meters that way and is a museum that's open to the public. And when he passed away in 1955, he said, leave my estate as a public park for the people of Illinois. And we've been a public park since we opened in 1958, and uh, there's been a First Division museum here since 1960. Uh, why is that? Because along with all of his other achievements, Colonel McCormick was a combat veteran of the 1st Division in the United States Army, now the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One. And he was devoted to his fellow veterans and to that institution and the society for the rest of his life. And uh, we carry on that tradition in this museum and events like this. So on behalf of the Colonel and our Board of Directors and the McCormick Foundation, and Cantini. I'm delighted to have you here tonight. Our program is called Leadership in Action, African American Military Makers. Uh, tonight promises to be educational and inspirational, full of powerful stories of leadership and service. Uh, we do this because African Americans have served in our country's wars and our armed forces from the very beginning of our history. And for most of that history, African American soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines have also struggled against daunting obstacles, first of slavery and then of prejudice, discrimination, and misunderstanding, and yet served valiantly and nobly and loyally nevertheless. Tonight we have with us retired U.S. Army Lieutenant General Russell L. Honore, commander among many other distinct, uh, distinctions of his military career, uh, commander of the task force uh, that took over following Hurricane uh, Katrina and helped pull New Orleans and the Gulf Coast out of that disaster. Uh, he is also the author of a new book, Leadership in the New Normal, which he'll discuss. We welcome back retired U.S. Army Colonel Eugene Scott, and we also have with us Sergeant Major Barnell Her Heron, Jr., uh, an active uh, senior non-commissioned officer with the 1st Infantry Division who has joined us from Fort Riley, Kansas. Uh, because he's an active soldier, Sergeant Major Heron has been told this morning by his boss he's got to be back tonight. That was not the original plan, but the defense of the Republic requires him back at Fort Riley as well. There's a big snowstorm headed in, and, uh, and so he's got to be back. So we're going to, we've shifted the program around a little bit to give him some time to speak at the front end here because he's going to leave us about 8.15, 8.30. And so that's that. And I, I would also say that we had one other gentleman here. We had a retired uh, Air Force Major General who was going to be with us tonight uh, on the assumption that his doctor would release him. He just had some knee surgery about a week or so ago, and he let us know the day before yesterday that he will be unable to fly. Uh, Major General retired Al Flowers, he will not be joining us tonight, and that's a shame. But what it leaves us with in Sergeant Major Heron and Colonel Scott and General Honore is three Army veterans of the 1st Division. So I love that. <laughs> so I would, now, I would now not only like to, it's my great privilege to introduce my colleague, Ms. Juliana Richardson, the founder and executive director of the History Makers. She is a Harvard-trained lawyer who has committed her life to documenting the African-American experience using video uh, recorded oral history, and she is an oral history, oral historian committed to the art of storytelling. Julianne. That was great. It's really a pleasure to be here uh, this um, evening and back here at the First Division um, Museum. Uh, Paul has provided over the last, um, now two years, wonderful leadership as part of our advisory board uh, that has guided this project. My father was uh, 25 years in the military, so in many ways he would be, he's deceased now, but he, he's really smiling down that I'm doing this project. Our 
Um, our archives, for those of you who don't know it, we've grown over the last um, uh, 13 years into the nation's largest African-American video oral history archive. Our collection numbers um, now almost 9,000 hours of African-American testimony on tape. Our oldest, 114, just her funeral was just on Saturday, Louisiana Hines, who was World War a uh, riveter and um, uh, in um, World War One, and um, our youngest um, it was a prima ballerina who was 29 at the time of interview. The earliest re recollection in our collection goes back into the 1700s. The collection is really an amazing collection, and with the help of all of you here, we can make it even better. While we have a lot of um, interviews in our collection that talk about uh, military service, we are a collection of those in the, uh, who've made their, their careers, the U.S. military, is much smaller. And this has been my dream and my goal um, for almost 10 years to really build this category. And had it not been for the kind um, um, donation of the McCormick Foundation, uh, we would not be here tonight. Um, they have funded us at a $200,000 level uh, to add uh, 40 interviews into our collection. Um, we really view ourselves as new black history at your fingertips. And what I'd like to do, because we've been busy uh, this last year, is have you take a look at the work that we've done. Um, I just want to make an announcement before I go on to the military. This uh, Friday night, um, as our fundraiser, we do a PBS special, which you saw at the beginning of that. And this Friday night um, at uh, 10 p.m., an evening with Barry Gordy is airing on WTTW. I also want to, um, because a project like this takes a lot of hands in it, and I, I want to thank the team here at the First Division. They're absolutely marvelous. Uh, they include J.D. Cams, Cam uh, Galen Piper, Rich Welch, and Keith Gill. I also want to thank my hardworking team, Azu Sun, who I saw just poke her head in, who's my business and operations manager, Joshua Murray, who's our researcher, Paul Mackey, um, who is our production manager, Shelby Clemens, um, who made all the contacts for the scheduling and is our production scheduler as we send crews around the country. And I have two of the best, my, my key volunteers here, they've been with us for 13 and 12 years respectively. That's Phyllis Ray in the back, who's our volunteer coordinator, and Ali Morrow Young, who I think is out there. So I want to thank them. Because you don't do work like this by yourself. I also want to encourage you, um, we, this is a special program because we do have um, General Honore here. And, um, you know, I think of you with Katrina and um, how you protected our country when it looked like everyone had abandoned uh, New Orleans in a time of great need. Um, he has authored a book, and we're going to have a book signing afterwards, Leadership in the New Normal. And I think we have a lot to learn about that as this country is sometimes still struggling uh, with leadership in the search of that. And that's our subject uh, tonight, um, because when you look at military training, it says a lot about what is really needed in our society um, right now, and especially as we look at some of the things that are happening in the city of Chicago. Um, the grant, I also want to talk about those who made the grant uh, possible. Uh, David Hiller, who couldn't be here this evening, is head of the uh, McCormick Foundation. Anna Lubbock is our program officer. And the Mary D., um, who that name is very familiar to lots of you, she's the one who first brought me to the McCormick Foundation back when we were in the year 2000 and I was starting, and not many people understood my vision. And she took 
us to the, at that time, the McCormick Tribune Foundation, and they funded our first, gave us our first 50,000 to get started. And for something that is a vision um, and to try to make it reality, you need things like that. And then Don Wycliffe, who is one of our history makers, uh, media makers, who is now on the board of the McCormick Foundation. So things don't happen. We have raised, um, to date, about uh, $16 million, uh, but our work is far from over. A lot of times people say, oh my God, that's a lot of money, but what money, what price do you put on something whose value is priceless? Um, there's been so little recording of the African American experience. Um, when you look, um, and I would ask that you go to tours of different military museums, you see, still see the voice of the African American soldier still missing. So our work, we need a lot of people helping us uh, with our work. Hi, Herman. I see someone in the back. I'm sorry, I just saw you, but I have to acknowledge him because um, we were also blessed with a grant to interview 180 of the nation's top scientists, and Herman White is a leading physicist here associated with Fermi Labs for the last 26 years. Now, I want to show you, because we, I want to not take up too much time. Um, Paul, can you pull up? Can I see the digital archive? Um, we, um, people ask me, so what really are you doing with these interviews? Um, and we've been working really hard over the last 13 years in, in collaboration with Carnegie Mellon, who has worked with us for um, all this time with really no funding from us to create this wonderful digital archive. Uh, we only have 400, almost, well, almost 400 of our interviews on, but in a couple months, we'll have another 200 added. And we've got a lot of work to add the remaining 1,800. But I just uh, typed in Army, and I want to show you um, this. Um, and I'm not going to take a lot of time, but we'll have demonstrations um, at the end of the program. But let's just let me go on to um, so I was asking Bobby you, Rush. How did you, I mean, you know, how we you know as a Black Panther. Well, um, but that was, also, you know, you, those kind of things you really focus on because of your peer, peer group. And at the time, there were about three or four of us that hung out together a lot. And we were all talking about going to service. And basically, within, I guess, 60 days, all of us went to different branches of service. Uh, we had one uh, uh, who went to, two of them went to the Marines, I went to the Army, and uh, I, I'm not sure whether I can. Now we'd have to, I'm gonna cut that loose, but we're gonna be showing demonstrations at the end, but this, this corpus is entirely searchable by image and text, just with typing in keywords. Um, we will have, when it is completed, almost 20,000 hours of testimony that we've recorded on tape that will be totally accessible. History that you, a lot of history that we don't know and that has been really hidden from view. And this is the jewel that we are hoping that our project will lead, uh, leave to the world. Think about it, Bobby Rush, uh, Black Panther, Bobby Rush, U.S. Senator. Who knows, maybe Bobby Rush was part of the First Division. Um, with, <laughs> and it, without <laughs> any further ado, um, I'd like to introduce a person who is near and dear to the Chicago community um, he was featured last year with our program here. He's retired U.S. Car Army Colonel Eugene Scott. Um, his, since his retirement, uh, Colonel Scott has served as manager for Sinstec Enterprises and publisher of the Chicago Daily Defender. He now heads Chicago Tribune, I mean Chicago Defender Charities, which also is the producer of the well-known and renowned a Bud Billiken Parade, the oldest black parade in the United States. He has served on a no number of boards and committees, including the Bronzeville Military Academy, which he serves now um, on the board, 
and as chairman of the National American Military Museum. He entered the U.S. Army in 1962 and served in Germany as the principal staff officer for training and operations for the 8th Infantry Division Combat Ready Forces before serving in Vietnam. Scott finished his military career as a post commander for two major U.S. Army installations. Please help me in welcoming retired Colonel Eugene Frederick Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana and Paul. It's uh, my pleasure to be back here this year to participate in this program. It's uh, truly an honor to be here. As you know, our theme tonight is about leadership and service and the African Americans in the United States military. Sometimes we have to sort of take note and realize what our contribution has been over the centuries. I think about my own great-grandfather that served in the Civil War with the 29th Illinois. I think about my grandfather that served in World War I. I think about my father that served in World War II. I think about my uncle that served in the Korean War. I think about myself who served in the Vietnam War and I think about my daughter, who served in the Iraq War. So the way this is going to work tonight, I will introduce each of our speakers, who will each speak for 10 minutes, providing us with their family background, schooling, and their illustrious military career, including what they and including what they are most proud of. Then I'm going to lead a 30-minute discussion with all of our speakers. And the focus of that discussion is going to be leadership. And also, we will identify those things that were important in the careers of these soldiers. And our last part of our program will be a 10-minute presentation by each of our speakers. And finally, we will get some audience participation and have our audience to ask questions of our panelists. We are truly honored and blessed to a certain extent to have our hero, General Russell Henry, here today. Yes. Yeah. And also as a panelist, and I mentioned to the Sergeant Major, Sergeant Major, your rank speaks for itself. That you really don't have to say anymore. When you go from a recruit to a Sergeant Major, that is saying it all. And the Sergeant Majors all demonstrate, they speak leadership. When you see them, it's all about leadership. At this time, I'd like to welcome to the stage Sergeant Major Barnell Heron of the illustrious 1st Infantry Division. Can I get a whore? Hoor. Can I get a whore? That's what the Army stands for. Everything in the Army says who, which means that I'm ready to do anything for the United States Army. First, I just want to thank Colonel Scott for giving me the opportunity to come and speak tonight. I also want to thank the, the Contigny Museum for giving out another opportunity to be here tonight to speak on the list of side, the senior non-commissioned officer side of the non-commissioned officer of the United States Army, particularly Fort Riley and First Infantry Division. Forward first, no mission too difficult, no sacrifice too great. Duty first. The first thing I want to talk about is a little bit about myself. As you know, I'm a, I'm a tall guy. I'm bald-headed. I used to have hair back in the day. But as you know, Army has grown me a little bit, so I got a little bit of uh, stress and everything, not just from the Army, but from my kids, so I don't have too much hair. But I came from, I just want to speak about what leadership means to me in the Army, and I'm going to wrap it up as this. 
I grew up in a little town called Whiteville, Tennessee, about 20 miles just east of Memphis, where they had cotton fields, hay bales, and I worked into a production line. I was lacking self-confidence. I couldn't inspire myself. I had talents, but I got them beat down upon me all the time. Then I ran to a recruiter at high school one day. He said, do you want to be all you, you can be? I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> well, one day my dad said, well, you're going to do something in life. You're not just going to sit around the house and mope and mumble. You see, I was kind of introverted and scared and not, uh, I was real shy, I didn't have a girlfriend. Everybody thought I was mute because I didn't talk a lot. But I said, I pulled a card out of my back pocket and said, you know, join the Army. So I joined the Army and I left. And it began to open my eyes up to another side of what world has to offer, what society has to offer. And I ran into this young man, drill sergeant, staff sergeant in Washington, that I saw was six foot two, about 180 pounds, had BDUs on starch with his boots laced properly, and it was spit shiny. He had a round brown on with a slim mustache. And his bustle bulged out, and I said, wow, I won't be just like him. I guess you can be all you can be in the Army. And so as I began to go through basic training and began to instill those values that my parents had laid in my life, I began to gather confidence within myself. And I began to figure out that I can do certain things. I, I am a, a man. I am an army of one. I am, I can do anything if I choose to do that, if I believe in it. So the army began to give me values, Lord, to do the respect, honor, integrity, self-service, and personal courage. And so I learned those things and I began to progress my military career. And as the great colonel said, I went from a private to a senior non-commissioned officer and served 26 years in the United States Army, March 3rd of this year, it'll be 26 years. But it also allowed me to see, thank you. I also had a speech impediment. I stuttered when I was in high school. So I didn't know how to do public speaking. And my parents said I had a, a problem. So I, when I joined the Army, my platoon sergeant pushed me out of formation to sing cadence. Cadence callers keeps a unit within rhythm with, his, with each other on the left foot. And so I began to sing cadence because I was so scared. It wasn't because when I was raised that stuttering was not a problem. It was my fear of stepping out into my leadership and to what I was supposed to do. But somebody had to push me out, which he made me get out in front of 150 soldiers and start singing cadence. And I began to sing louder and louder, and my confidence began to build. That's what leadership means to me. And then I began to say, I wasn't that smart in high school. I barely graduated high school. And then I joined the Army. And the Army said you can get education through the Army education system. So my platoon sergeant rolled me into classes, and I began to get better and better. And I got an associate's degree. Then my confidence built more, and then I got a bachelor's degree. Now I'm working on a master's degree in the United States Army. That's what the Army has gave me the ability to do. <laughs> Not only that, I didn't join the Army just because of the pay, or just because I was trying to get away from home. I wanted to do something that was different than anybody else was doing where I grew up at. So I joined the Army, and my first thing that I got told to do was be a recruiter. I became a recruiter. I was scared to speak in front of people, but I began to open up my mouth and begin to get mentorship, and I became one of the best recruiters where I was located in Youngstown, Ohio. Then Army, the war on terrorism started. Then I said, you know what? I don't want to do this no more. I want to do something that I was called to do. Lead soldiers, mentor them, and keep them out of harm's way, to train them to fight this war on terrorism. So I picked up and took off this dress uniform and put on my camouflage uniform. I went back into the fight. I got four conflicts in Iraq, back to back, all within an eight or nine year span. I did four years in eight or nine year span. From a squad leader, didn't know how to have courage in myself, but I found enough intestinal fortitude to lead soldiers in firefights on convoys going down Tampa. Then I began to mentor my junior NCOs to do the same thing, which I built through their confidence. Then I made the rank of SAR first class, became a truck master, which is the leading guy within our company to make sure the operation flows good for logistical reasons for transportation to support the warfighter. I went to Baghdad in the middle of downtown where my heartbeat was so, racing so much that I had to calm myself down because I began to hit upside my head. But I began to listen to what Drill Sound Washington told me and said, you, you got talent, you got a gift, just step out on it. So I began to calm myself and I led my platoon down there to deliver connexes to a rail yard. That's what leadership means for me, what Army has done for me. Then the next thing I began to make first sergeant which is a diamond in the rough, they call it, or the top 
of the NCO. And I began to mentor my junior student, not leaving them behind. I was a follower and also a leader at the same time. Then I became a sergeant major and began to even mentor more. Mentor more and more and more. That's what leadership means to me, not because of what I can influence, but how can I affect somebody's lives to be a leader, to change how they perceive how things are supposed to be and how they can affect somebody else to achieve something. What is the goal? What is the purpose? That's what leadership means to me. It's just not an ordinary thing. Leadership meaning just not me getting promoted, but helping others to achieve what I have achieved in my life. Not just in the military, but on my civilian sides. I have a son in the United States, so I have two kids that are in college. I intend to pour into them what others have poured into me. That's what leadership means to me. So I just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight, giving me the opportunity just to be in this uniform and to serve my country with dignity and honor. To, and, honor. and hopefully I can do it for another four years if the good Lord allow me to do that. But I just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight, giving me the opportunity to tell you what leadership means to me and who I am and what I inspired to be. So thank you. After a short introduction, the next voice you hear will be our special hero General, Lieutenant General Russell Honoree. You know, my worst day, I will not have had it as bad as those African Americans who served under General Washington who fought for the freedom of our nation. 20% of them who were slaves and fought throughout the Revolutionary War with a promise of freedom that was given to them on the Declaration of Independence. That this berating by my fellow students is little in comparison with the sacrifice of those who served our nation before us when they themselves were not free. And if this is what it took, this is what it took. And those of us who stayed in and got commissioned clearly understood that. My objective was to go in the Army and stay until I was about a major, then get out and come back and go to work in agriculture. But when I went in the Army, I had an obligation to serve, I think, four years. And again, what started off as an obligation at the end of those four years ended up as a way of life. This storm showed you what can happen when you have a disaster like Katrina, where you have a large number of people living in a uh, small area, and uh, the power of a storm or earthquake or a mammy disaster can really create chaos. And uh, normally when that happens, it will be the poor, uninformed people who are going to be affected the most. And we need to prepare before these events to make sure we have good contingency in our community, to make sure that we take care of those who can't take care of themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, my honor, General Honore.
Well, it's an honor to be here. It's uh, been a life promise that I made about uh, 15 years ago that I would visit Kentigny. I uh, had the honor of spending six of my years of my life in the First Division, in the duty first. As a matter of fact, one of the proudest things I wear on my uniform uh, when I was in service is my right shoulder patch. And that is a patch of the 1st Infantry Division. That concept of duty first uh, is a empowering uh, statement. No mission too difficult, no sacrifice too great. Duty first. And uh, listening to the Sergeant Major uh, eloquently uh, telling his story, uh, I could almost do a repeat. But rather than repeat, uh, I'd like to be brief and uh, again pay uh, honor to the great work that's been done here at Cantigny uh, in this museum and that from the endowment of the McCormick Foundation and the importance that it continued to play today uh, in the uh, social makeup uh, of this great nation, the United States of America. And uh, for that gift that uh, he left to uh, this community and to this nation, we're here today. Uh, I first heard of Cantigny from my boss, who uh, Major General Neil Creighton, who was here at, uh, with the McCormick Foundation for some years. Uh, are you talking about a, uh, a life experience? I was a, a captain serving in Germany in the 1st Infantry Division, uh, in there minding my own business, uh, pushing paper on the 1st Infantry Division staff. And uh, one day the chief of staff sent me a note and said, uh, Honor, I want you to come see me. So I went up and seen him and he said, um, uh, I want you to be in charge of the Weeblos. I said, so what is Weeblo? <laughs> he said, well, go figure it out. As all you know, it's a part of the Boy Scouts. Well, I wasn't in the Boy Scouts because when I was growing up in South Louisiana, I couldn't be in the Boy Scouts. We were not, uh, there was no Boy Scout troop for me in Point Capete Parish where I grew up. So I didn't grow up with scouting. And uh, so I, the chief of staff said, uh, go see uh, Miss so-and-so, she will give you the key to the Weeblow Hut tonight <laughs> and meet you there at 5.30 and you're in charge of the Weeblows. <laughs> so I showed up and for each week for throughout the winter, I would meet these little bad boys. <laughs> <laughs> Myself, uh, my wife and I at that time had a daughter, uh, and our son was uh, about two years old. He's a staff sergeant in the United States Army now, but he was uh, just a toddler. And the colonel told me, he said, you're going to learn things that's going to help you raise your own kids. So it's going to be good for you, trust me. So from that experience, uh, the end of February came, and we had a scout jamboree on Gerbergen, Germany. So I was to take the wee blows on Saturday afternoon because this jamboree was for the biggest scouts. I uh, took those little six little nasty boys and we went up <laughs> and did what scouts did, shake with the wrong hand and did all kind of traditions. And come about eight o'clock, I got involved with a war story with one of my buddies and looked around and them little boys were gone. <laughs> <laughs> so Colonel Scott said, man, you can imagine I'm running all over this campground looking for these little boys. And I can't find them. So finally, I, uh, this is before cell phones, I ran across the post and ran to the chief of staff house, knocked on the door, and I said, boys, we got a problem. <laughs> he said, what's the problem, Captain? He said, I, I lost them boys. <laughs> he said, don't worry about it. He said, they've been here for a half hour. He said, I was wondering when you were going to show up. <laughs> it's not always the things that uh, you, you start out doing that 
can end up making a difference. From that, that colonel said, uh, you, you did something I asked you to do, and I'm going to make sure I take care of you. And within two months, our commanding general got picked to be a two-star general, and he said, if you can handle them little boys, you can be an aide. You can take care of damn general. <laughs> so he sent me off as an aide de camp to then Major General Neil Creighton, who spent years right here in Chicago and area and uh, finished out the development of this great museum uh, and uh, spent about three or four years here, he and his wife. So from that experience, uh, I learned uh, what, if I ever was to get promoted, what senior leadership ought to look like. And earlier we talked about the Revolutionary War. I'm not going to talk about myself. I prefer talking about people that didn't get recognized. And going back to our Revolutionary War, those who uh, served uh, that were never recognized under General Washington, 20% of his army made up of African Americans, uh, not recognized for their service. And all first veterans, the entire uh, army under Washington, uh, they, what did they fight for? They fought for freedom. Uh, many of them couldn't read. You know, the British Army would see them on the battlefield and they would make jokes about them. But they were empowered by the words of the Declaration of Independence that promised freedom. And from that, we know the rest of the story today. Uh, they fought for a promise. They, there was no VA to take care of them. There was no uh, pension uh, to give them uh, when they got, they fought for one purpose, that the purpose of freedom. Uh, and uh, we know the rest of the story. And historians have uh, looked and said, well, how did we win that war? Well, we won that war because the British soldiers fought for the king. And your ancestors, ladies and gentlemen, fought for freedom. The most powerful word from one of the most powerful documents ever written, the Declaration of Independence. The words of the Declaration of Independence were so powerful at the time of its writing, King George III of England asked the people of England to pray that the words of the Declaration of Independence would never come to fruition, for he knew it would be the end of his form of government. And for generations since those first veterans who fought under Washington and helped create our nation, every generation has kept our nation free. And we go home at night to those who are not here today, the school children, your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews, and those who are probably getting ready for school tomorrow. Uh, we ought to tell them those stories and remind them that they have an obligation, and that is to leave America free for the next generation to leave America free for the next generation. And you know what? Whatever it takes. I was at a university yesterday, and the uh, university is struggling with money like most institutions. And um, my instructions to the students, I'm not worried about you. I'm not worried the fact that you got a student loan to pay when you finish college. I really don't give a damn. Because you know what? Unlike your forefathers who, for instance, coming up on the centennial of World War I, there's no train waiting outside the village to put you on to ship you off the war. And as in the case of World War II, there's no train of buses picking up every able-bodied young man in town and shipping them off to World War I. Or the same thing for Korea. Or the same thing for Vietnam. The World War is hopefully all over. We got a volunteer service now. So I don't feel sorry for you that you may have to sacrifice and pay for your damn college. <laughs> because many people have paid a lot more for you to enjoy this freedom that you have here today. And freedom that comes too lightly is far too less esteemed. People have a tendency to look at freedom as a right and not as an obligation. So I'm here tonight. Thank you for inviting me here. And I, uh, I am a better person for having served the United States Army. And I am proud to have worn our nation's cloth nine and a half years overseas, 37 years, three months, and three days, because I made it home. God bless you, and it's good to be here.
At this time, the uh, panel will uh, discuss some contemporary leadership challenges and also discuss some defining moments in their own personal career. Except, Colonel, we have to release this gentleman. Come on. <laughs> Because the uh, Sergeant Major is on active duty, he wasn't going to be able to discuss our first question anyway. Uh, so you have to receive both General Honorary and my comments on our first question, is that, and which is a contemporary question about what would you say needs to be done in places like Chicago? That's a big question. Uh, I'm going to make some comments first since on a daily basis I deal with youth in Chicago. I have about 75 to 100,000 that participate in our annual Bud Billiken Parade. And they come out when asked to come out. We, it's us, we the leaders have to figure out a way to deal with these young people. They are challenged, but they're not lost because they are our children. We must find a way to put them on the straight and narrow. Some of it's tough love by saying you have to get your act together and putting some meaning and force behind that. Some of, it, some of it is what my wife tells me every day and she does when she works with those kids is caring and love. Making them feel like they're wanted. I could tell you a thousand stories of having taken youth and work with them, given them a job and put them on the straight and narrow. It's a strange thing about if you're working you don't have time for a lot of foolishness. Because you've got to be home at a reasonable time at night. Because you've got to get up in the morning if you want to keep your job. And what a lot of those young people are looking for is jobs and some kind of income. I had 50 two summers ago. The parents came to me and said, I think you may have saved my son's life this summer. 
because you gave him a job, and they're all ready. They, they will line up and be first in line to get that paycheck because they need money. We all need money, and we've got to find a way as the leaders in the community and the caretakers for these young people uh, to find their way. And uh, again, I, I applied the tough love and the wife gave the kisses and the hugs. I didn't hug anybody. I don't want to hug you. I pat you on the shoulder when you, when you do what you're supposed to do or hit you on the butt when you do what you're not supposed to do. That's the way life is. This is not no easy thing out here. It's tough. General, any comments? Well, I don't profess to be an expert at this, but what came to my um, observation during Katrina, uh, what that storm undercover was the enormous impact of uh, disasters on people that are, are struck in poverty. And since I left the Army, the way I speak to this is, my observation is a few years ago when uh, President Obama and Senator McCain were in a battle for the presidency, he spoke a lot about Wall Street and Main Street. Uh, my discovery during Katrina, there's another street in America. You know where Wall Street is? It's still there, that two weeks ago. And my definition of Main Street is people with jobs and people who can get jobs. But there's another street in America that I've come to call Railroad Street. And in, throughout the South, Railroad Street is not just a metaphor, it's a place. You show me where the railroad passed and I'll show you where a lot of the elderly, the disabled, and the poor lives. A community that's uh, underserved by education and uh, medical, but overserved by police and drug lords. Uh, I think what we've got is a big old case of Railroad Street in operation. Kids that, uh, many of them come from single fa family homes. Many of them come from uh, uh, poor communities. And one of the solutions to ending the issues that we see happening in violence in our communities is that we've got to cut off that flow of drugs from Mexico and we've got to talk about it. We never made it a national issue. It continues today, and that drug is coming in the back of containers and in the back of trucks and in the bellies of 747s. We've got to cut off that drug flow or come out of Mexico. We've got to get control of our streets, and uh, we've got to reinforce the school system, all at a time when the cities and the states are broke. Uh, so. I think we've got to go back and readdress poverty. Because you know what? You don't see this happening in rich communities. Or even in well off middle class communities, you don't see it happening. It's a link right back to poverty. And I think we've got to fix Railroad Street. And when you go back into the Night War in New Orleans, which is still plagued by violence, uh, the common theme in the Night War in New Orleans is poverty. And it's been that way for the last 35 years. And you show me where the violence is happening in the city, and I'll show you a whole class of kids that are growing up that are not reading at fourth grade level. Matter of fact, there's some studies going on in some cities to look at the fourth grade reading level of minority young men. And from that, you can figure out a formula to figure out how many prisons you need in 20 years. And that's a damn shame. And it's never been talked about at the national level. So we've got to fix that because that's human capital that's not being developed. For every one of those kids that get killed, there are one or two more that are injured for life by bullets. And a friend sent me a note last night when I told him what we were going to talk about, one of the topics we were going to talk about. He said, well, you want, to, you want to mess with the Second Amendment. I said, no, I don't want your damn guns. We want to figure out how we stop these kids from killing one another. 
And uh, one of the things we've got to do is we've got to focus on a better education system and we've got to culturally change. The culture that create kids by 10, 12, 13 years old that are on the street and not in school has to change. And it's not okay to start having babies when you're a baby. When I was in high school, the uh, unwed mother rate, according to data from the National Defense, uh, Children's Defense Fund, was about 15% of uh, young kids were born out of wedlock. Uh, today, in some parts of our community, it's over 70%. Now, how did that happen? When did that got to be okay? When did that get to be fashionable? And uh, I think um, if we're going to work on that, we've got to talk about it. And it's got to be a part of the conversation, and it ought to be a part of the uh, conversation of who we elect for our political officers. Because we've got to be prepared to take that on. But politics and politicians by themselves are not good enough to fix this. It's going to take parents. Uh, I've got relatives in Baton Rouge from where I come that uh, uh, have had children and not married. It's just a fact. Uh, how are we going to deal with that inside of our families? How do we going to deal with that inside our communities? Because it's an attributing factor. But the thing that's stoking the fire is the drugs on the street and these kids get in gangs and people talk about the camaraderie and all that. The camaraderie is around controlling the drugs on the street. And who are buying the drugs is the kids on Michigan Avenue. And But who's going to jail? The kids off Railroad Street. Who's shooting each other for power of controlling those drugs? I understand there's a, world, there's a drug lord here in Chicago. Why haven't they caught him? Why you got police working overtime watching foot basketball game and they're not on the damn street running this drug lord down? We can put drones over here. I can tell you, we can find him. Politicians got to be committed to finding him. Don't tell me you can't find him. You can find him. So how do we get the politicians to do the right thing and put the force in that it takes and you don't have enough police in Chicago. And you need to look at how, how many teachers in the classroom because a lot of these kids are being raised by a single parent. Well, that's all I got to say about this, but I'm not an expert on it, but I know enough to know, I know what to do. <laughs> On a, on a daily basis, uh, many of our young people come into our office looking for careers. Some we steer to college, many we steer to the military. Last year we sent 11 outstanding young recruits to Great Lakes. And I'm here to report that they're all doing fine. I'm so proud of them. I went to each one of their graduations at Great Lake, showing that we really care. I've got two out at San Diego. I've got three on the Nimitz, an aircraft carrier. Got one in Valencia. I don't know how he got to Vin Vin Valencia, uh, Italy, uh, but uh, they got good assignments. They got good training and they know exactly what they need to do to have good naval careers. Now, a question is, what, what paths are there in the military that are comparable with careers in civilian life? Well, the answer to that is just about any. Any career in, the, in, in civilian life, there's a parallel career in the military. I have one young man that's an orthopedic surgeon assistant out at San Diego Hospital. He joined a year and a half ago. You, f you tell me a career and we'll find some training for that career in the military. 
Many of these opportunities our young people don't know about. My daughter spent 26 years in the military because her father was a career officer. Mm. So you gotta have some connection. After World War II and the draft, we, we got away from knowing about the military and its great contributions to our society. Gotta get back to them, some of that. I'm not advocating the draft, so don't put me down on that. But we gotta get back to much of that. Well, I think uh, the one of the chapters I wrote in this, um, this new book is to save your best leadership from when you get home. Uh, I wrote that because of my observation in the military of um, having raised four children ourselves and having moved 24 times. Uh, and then having as a senior officer to deal with uh, domestic uh, issues, meaning some of our leader, senior leaders dealing with their teenagers were uh, every now and then would pop up on the screen um, for having a domestic disturbance, trying to correct their kids. And that chapter uh, was uh, written with them in mind and myself in mind from my own experience. Because what, what I learned over that time was leading at work is easy. Leading at home is hard. <laughs> leading at work, you got the uh, Uniform Code of Military Justice in my case. Uh, in the workforce, you've got a job book. You've got HR standards. Uh, that describe who does what and uh, how do you deal with people with discipline problems. But how do you deal with a 14-year-old sitting across the table from you and you ask them, what would you do in school today? Nothing. <laughs> what you learn? Nothing. Who do you talk to? Nobody. And they're wearing all black and they got metal and stuff coming out of their face. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's not a fad. That's a leadership challenge. That's a leadership challenge. And how, how do we deal with that? Because if you look at what is leadership, I grew up in an army that many of you veterans in the, uh, here grew up with, is the art and science of getting people to accomplish a mission or a task. I've learned since then and that the true art of leadership is getting people to willingly follow to accomplish uh, a mission or a task. And to get people to do the right thing when nobody's looking. Because many would do it if you're watching. But how do you create, how do you raise your kids so they act like you're watching them all the time? Well, it's, it's a function of leadership. And uh, being a good leader, you got to walk the talk. And your audio and your video has to match. You can't come in there and get yourself silly drinking Jack Daniels in the evening and then talk to your kids about not drinking. You can't talk to your kids about, oh, you're not going to smoke and you've got a, a Dutch master hanging out your mouth. I mean, the audio and video have to match. And all of you that raised kids, you know what I'm talking about. But how do we pass that on? to uh, our children who are raising grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. Leading, uh, raising kids is about leadership. You want to ask me how great a leader was? Let me look at his kids. Because leading at work is easy. Leading at home is hard. Because that's a leadership challenge. And I think that is one of the defining things of of uh, how great leaders are, show me the kids. Because if all they would do it was good at the office, then uh, you're empowered to be good at the office. Show me how good you are at home. Uh, General, in line with that, uh, could you identify uh, any of the attitudes today that may be influenced by military service? Well, the, one of the great lessons I learned from a public school teacher uh, came to me when I was leaving uh, New Roads, Louisiana, going off to Southern University. And 
one of my teachers told me, she said, uh, look, you're not the uh, sharpest knife in the basket, son. <laughs> but I'm going to give you three rules uh, that uh, if you follow them, you might make it. So she said, number one, uh, learn to do the routine thing well. And after finishing school at Southern University, I joined the outfit called the United States Army. That was much about doing the routine things well over and over and over. So that attribute uh, <coughs> stayed steady when she told me. And it got me through college, doing the routine thing well. You go to the class, the teacher tell you to do something, you do it, you get it done on time, and you graduate. Uh, the second thing she said, don't be afraid to take on the impossible. And when I went to school and my daddy dropped me off at the school in the back of that old 53 <laughs> Chevrolet pickup truck that wouldn't go in reverse. <laughs> so we had to figure out the part of the dorm that he could drive around. <laughs> and I hurried up and jumped out that old truck with, uh, uh, with an old beat up suitcase and a few bags of clothes. And he said, uh, uh, now boy, uh, I don't have much to give you, but you, you uh, remember where you come from. Remember how we raised you. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, starting and going to college with that $12 in my pocket, uh, that, that was uh, like taking on the impossible. But all that was easy. And I was in my 35th year service when I flew in New Orleans on a Navy helicopter, having served in Desert Storm, having done the Brown Star, having been a battalion command in Desert Storm, I deported the mom. I didn't know what that meant until I saw those people standing at the Superdome, or what that teacher had challenged me when I was coming out of high school. Don't be afraid to take on the impossible because that almost looked like the impossible. But I had been powered by those words and had been a student of leadership for 35 years. The other lesson she told me that came to fruition during Katrina was, and I hadn't been tested on up to that point, I'd had some in encounters, was don't be afraid to act even if you're being criticized. So in 35 years, well actually, at that time, almost 40 years, because I didn't learn that unless I come out of high school, it, it came to stick what that really meant. Because the opening days of Katrina was much about being criticized. <coughs> the criticism before was, well, you don't write well. You know, you speak with an accent, you know. And, you know, all kind of little things like that people would ding you about. But this was being on, uh, on the uh, world stage. <coughs> And those lessons from that public school teacher stayed true uh, throughout my military career. So again, how we teach kids to do the routine <coughs> things well. Because you know what, they don't do the routine things well, they're not getting out of school. And we need not spoil them. Uh, I was offered to come to Atlanta and go to a church uh, my last year in the Army. They wanted me to come speak at Men's Day. So I got there, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Big old up in the <clears throat> church in downtown Atlanta, all the Cadillacs and Mercedes outside. And I'm standing there saying, General, talk to us about leadership. So I look across the audience, nothing but a bunch of old people. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you want me to come here and talk about leadership? I said, where are you cheering? <laughs> well, I knew where they were. They were on their butts home sleeping. I said, you wasted my time. I can't do nothing with y'all, but if your kids were here, <laughs> why didn't you make them get up and come to church? <laughs> so, it speaks to that point. Again, what the teacher told me, do the routine things well. Don't be afraid to take on the impossible. And don't be afraid to act, uh, even if you're being criticized. Those lessons stay with me. But what also stayed with me was this, this, uh, there's motivation to act. And when you see something, you speak to it. And, and challenging that, the congregation that day, and there was silence in the room. And the pastor came up to 
me after and said, well, you know what it is. And, you know, these kids got their own life now. I said, no, they don't have their own life. They're living in your house. You make them get off their butt and come to church. You take the damn keys from them. They don't, they not, God didn't give them in the Constitution a right to have a car. <laughs> So a part of the problem, you know, an old first sergeant told me, he said, for every finger you point, there's three pointing back at you. So a part of the problem we've got the day we created it. We created it. A land of expectation. A land of expectation. That's turned into what people think are, are entitlements. And uh, we've got to fix that. Because, and we got to do it on our watch. Because if we don't speak the truth of what's happening in our community, we're going to have a problem. And, we're, and the problem's going to get worse. Because I see the problem not only coming out of the community that's economically challenged. I see middle class families with kids they're having to hire lawyers for because the kid was out selling drugs. Where in the hell that came from? Because we, we overspoil them. And we're going to have to fix that. And we got to speak to it in the family. And, and it's, not, it's not okay to say nothing. Your grandmama would not sit around. Well, one generation we lost this in our community. Where the grandmama would walk in and said, girl, what are you wearing? <laughs> Better go get some damn clothes on you. <laughs> so what we do today when we see kids doing something that, that's not uh, in the norm. So do the routine things well. Don't be afraid to take on the impossible. We've got to take this problem on. You want to solve this problem, you take this brigade of people here, and we get out on the street and start uh, uh, looking at what's going on. We make a difference. Uh, well, Vince, this is a special opportunity for you, so I'm not going to ask all the questions and make the comments with uh, General Honoree. I'm going to allow you an opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, the only thing I ask is that as I open the floor for some questions, there are two microphones set up in the audience. Okay. And there'll be one person passing around the microphone. Please avoid lengthy statements. We strongly encourage any youth in the audience to ask questions. We really do want to hear what you have to say because you are part of the problem. <laughs> and, we, and the solution. And we are hoping, based on this event, that you will be part of the solution. So I look forward to hearing from our young people. The floor is now open for questions or comments. Hi there, my name is John Stephen. And I guess one of the concerns I have is that the fact that a lot of us in the suburbs, and I look around tonight and I see we have a lot of the Afro-American community here. And man, that's exciting. I, I think of pastors like we have in Chicago, like Dr. James Ford, or others like Tony Evans down in, uh, down in Texas. And they, they, they really walk the talk. And I think here in Chicago, among a lot of the, the Afro-American churches, we see that. But my concern is with our federal government and the amount of dollars that we spend every four years to elect a president, regardless of race, the money that we are utilizing for this when it could be used on our kids instead. We have corporations making big bucks, you know, bottom line. But what are they giving back to this country to make us grow? We were fortunate when we had a military, when the kids would either be drafted, though that's not the route that we're going today, or they may have enlisted for a couple of years and obtained good education, good training. One more thing, Civilian Conservation Corps. When we see that developed after the Depression, kids getting involved in reforestation programs and working with the national parks. It developed their self-esteem. 
thousands and thousands of them were ready to go into World War II. And I think we need somebody that really is a spokesman that can speak to the issues today and not just be concerned about their own livelihood. That's it. General, did you want to comment on? Well, I think there's something fundamentally wrong with kids laying up in the bed <laughs> and the parents going to work or grandmama waiting until they get up to see what they want to eat. There's something fundamentally wrong with that in America. And uh, the body was meant to work. To work is a blessing. There, and in a lot of the community, our kids don't get jobs, so they're given jobs, and they end up in the drug business. And we've got a system in America called the cradle to jail system that's defined by the Children's Defense Fund. We've got to fix that. I'll just give you a fact. In Louisiana, we're not clean in Louisiana. We've got as many young men in prison in Louisiana as we have in college. And that's a damn shame. So the problem I'm telling you about is not unique to Chicago or the suburbs. It is in New Orleans. It's in Baton Rouge. It's in Shreveport. But the common denominator is those neighborhoods. You show me uh, where the poor neighborhoods are, and I'll show you where those kids are. And they make up the majority of the prison population. Seventy percent of the Louisiana prison population are young African-American men from poor families. Uh, Ninety percent of them had an experience with marijuana and other enabling drugs. Over 70 percent of them either uh, was some way in the drug trade at the time they were uh, sent to prison. We got to fix that. That's a lot of human capital uh, that will not be doctors, lawyers, teachers, welders, nurse, bus drivers, airplane drivers, fixers. Uh, as human capital is not going to be developed, is ending up in prison, or is ending up uh, being shot on the street. We got to fix that. The status quo is not good enough. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Chris Hurst, and General, I'd like to ask you: Have you? have or had any political aspirations or would you really consider running for any higher office and would you please run for higher office <laughs> I don't know if I'm qualified I mean I never smoked dope <laughs> never hang around with the interns didn't get picked up with a DWI I don't know if I'm qualified man I tell you Don't know if I'm qualified. <laughs> it was on honor to serve the nation for 37 years, trust me. And uh, I'll uh, do what I can from uh, this uh, uh, position and uh, speak to people and try to get people to act in their communities. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, I don't know if I'm willing to give up what it takes to be a politician. Uh, and I admire those who do it because it takes a lot of courage. But I, I, I'm at this, at this state, I don't think um, that would be the best thing um, for um, me. And I say that unselfishly, I've been served for 37 years. And I'm not quite sure if uh, the energy it takes uh, and the, uh, the bending of the people you'll have to hang out with to raise the money to run for office is something I want to do. But what the gentleman was saying earlier about the amount of money we put in politics to get people elected, and at the same time we're struggling now. The cities are broke. The states are broke. Uh, and our schools are not improving, if anything, uh, more and more people are sending kids to private school because the public school is broke. Uh, we, we need some change. And uh, I think the people in the audience here today have to demand it. And what did previous generations do when change was required? How did women get the right to vote? They hit the bricks. How did we integrate the country? 
we hit the bricks. How did we stop the war? The war in Vietnam stopped. We hit the bricks. We've been at war for 11 years. I, you can count the number of demonstrations we've had on, on one hand against people who've uh, said, hey, we don't want to be at war. So we, we've changed as a, uh, as a society, and I think we've got to, if people's voices have to be heard, and we have to hit the bricks. Now, some of us might be on canes and in wheelchairs, but we've got to hit the bricks because we can, we can force this to happen. Next question. Hi, my name is Bill Simmons. Um, I spent 40 years in law enforcement in DuPage County. I'm now on the Prisoner Review Board. Now, I see things within the prison that you people have no idea hmm. what's going on in there. We have 39 prisons in DuPage in, uh, in state of Illinois. Eight of them are juvenile facilities. And when I go into the juvenile facilities, I talk to these young men and women. Mm -hmm. uh, they need discipline, mm -hmm. all right? They come in there. Their parents come in when they're up for parole. They come before us, and we ask the parents. I ask the young uh, a mother, I say, why do, why, why do you want your son out? And their answer was, well, I need somebody to help me babysit my other kids. And the young man looked at me and said, I said, well, you know, you're going to go out of here, but there's some things I want you to do while, you, before, you know, while you're out here. But the problem is these young kids' parents have come out of the facilities, and they have no direction whatsoever, none whatsoever. They need discipline. They need parents to be able to tell them, you don't do this. Like you said, get up out the bed, get a job. Uh, even in the adult system, we're seeing a lot of young people getting arrested for unlawful use of weapons. I had a young man on a bicycle. Got stopped in Chicago, he took off on his bicycle, ran into a squad car, took a nine millimeter off of him. I asked him, what are you doing with his gun? He said, well, you know, I have to protect myself. I said, no, you didn't have to protect yourself. You're going to use that, that gun for something else. He mm -hmm. said, yeah. And not all these guys are, are, are drug dealers. For instance, a young man got out in May from a juvenile facility, 17 years old. He got out go to, and he got paroled. He was back in two weeks ago for murder. I asked him, I said, you know, and his counselor said, what are you doing? What, what? He said, well, you know what? We patrol our area. We patrol our block. If you don't live in our block and you're from another gang, we kill you. <sighs> you didn't even know this guy, did you? He said, nope. I'll do it again if I get out. And I'm saying, you're not going to get out. You're 18 years old. Just turning 18 years old. I go to court. You see these parents, they look worse than the kids. Hats on backwards, shirts out of their pants, and they're loud running their mouth. What does the kid learn? He learns what his parents teach him. And my thing is always telling kids, you learn, if you teach, your parents don't teach you, somebody else is going to teach you. And that's what those gangs are doing. I ran a gang unit for two, uh, two years out here in DuPage County. I went after the, the head of the gangs. I was told not to do that, but I did it anyhow, but then I said, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. But we need uh, parents to take control of their children. And you have, we have to start at a young age, five years old and on up. Because you get to 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, their mindset is already there. You have to be able to break that down. And it's very hard to do. It's very hard to do. Because they feel, they get involved in this gang, they feel that they're loved, and they're taken care of, and they're given direction. Regardless of what happens, they do it. You know, or they'll say, you know, this guy did it, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna rat on him. You're sitting in jail. He's out there having a ball. Mm. You, know, you, you try to talk to him. Even the older guys that have been in there 15, 20 years try to talk to these kids, and they tell them, hey, old man, you ain't can't tell me nothing. You know, and they, okay. All right. Bill, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks so much yeah. for your service, your comment. But, uh, this is really an opportunity for General Connery to talk to us. I, I could listen to your stories for a long time. You have insight that I don't have. But we need to ask questions. Thanks for your comments, sir. Yeah, and thank you for your service, too. Hello, um, my name is Zach. Um, Young person. Hey, Zach. Hi. Um, well, all I wanted to say was that um, 
with the prisons and stuff, like how they're kind of, like a lot of them are over capacity, is we should get some of the nonviolent, um, like, um, people out and actually have them do something productive with their life and not have them rotting in a prison if they're not violent at all and just sitting in there. I agree with you, Zach. Hi, my name is Linda Hodo, and every morning I'm afraid to listen to the news because some kid is shot every, every day. So my question is to you. You talked about, which I agree with, and I'm sure a lot of folks do, a systemic change, a cultural change. Uh, Bill has talked about has to start at five. But in the meantime, and I agree, and that makes sense, there are a lot of lovers. But in the meantime, I get confused on what we can do yeah. now. It, you know, at the end of World War II, the Marshall Plan yeah. totally recreated all the mess that World War II created. Invested that money, changed the culture. In fact, the Japanese culture took off in the 80s. Yeah. What can we start to do or ask our government to do that's sort of a United States or city Marshall Plan? And where would that money go first to start to make a difference? And to, you know, forget about all this discussion about Second Amendment, which is like a distraction. Mm -hmm. Where would you put a Marshall Plan in a city and what would be the leverage you would pull? Yeah, well, I think that's a fair question. There are many opinions of uh, people who may address that in the audience. But um, my take on that would be that we know some of the fundamental issues uh, in the communities that are challenged is uh, this nine-month school system is not working. Uh, I'll give you an example. I went to Chattanooga, worked with a Boys and Girls Club. And, and I'll tell you five more examples. The kids that go to this challenged high school in Chattanooga, the ones that are in the Boys and Girls Club, they graduate from high school at 99%. The same kids in that community that are not members of the Boys and Girls Club, they graduate at 40%. So how do we take these schools and expose them being from an eight to three o'clock infrastructure and make them an infrastructure until well into the evening and create an environment because the kids are not getting that environment and that reinforcement at home when they get home. Would be a way to do a Marshall Plan, a big idea type concept. The other thing is we gotta have a cultural shift. We gotta get the preachers in on this. And uh, other people in the community. We gotta have a cultural shift. We've seen two examples I can tell you of how the government, through policy, and through education, and the media, caused us to change. You remember when most people in this room were smoking? What happened? We did a cultural change. The government came up and told us the truth. These damn things will kill you. And it went from government, it went to schools. And we got the facts. And then they made it to Hollywood. And they took it off the television. It was no longer cool for them to be smoking on television. What else you saw? We saw it happen with AIDS. AIDS was an epidemic. We had people dying left and right. We made a cultural shift based on policy. Came out of Washington. Got into the school system. We were in Germany. I can remember my little nine-year-old daughter, our oldest daughter, walked in, Daddy, well, tell me about AIDS. And I said, what, did, what are you talking about? <laughs> She's nine-year-old. They're talking about AIDS at school. And the next thing you know, they made movies, some of the biggest tear-jerker movies i ever seen in my life. And what did it cause? It caused us to change as a society. All of us witnessed that. When we went from a society that tolerated smoking, I used to get on airplanes. I used to get in the back and smoke. <laughs> and thought it was cool and thought the people in the front weren't smelling it 
<laughs> Look how stupid we were. Were we stupid or what? And it started off with the government allowing that to happen, right? So we start off with policy, we educate people, and then we use the arts and the humanities through movies and, and uh, books to describe to us that change, and we change. But I do think government has a role to play. And in both of those great changes, and another one was the integration of the country. It started with what? With policy, through education and laws, and movies that were made that told the truth and the impact of how it was having on our human capital. And we change. Each generation has uh, their thing that they're faced with. Ours, what it is, is the declining uh, uh, development of too many of our youth ending up in prison and not being developed. Look, our country is not broke. It's bent. And each generation go through something. It wasn't proud to watch our nation go through integration. But you know, when we did it, we came out on the other side a better nation. And as we are struggling with these, these um, uh, throwback from uh, uh, not ending poverty and not talking about ending poverty, because much of the issues we come out of poor neighborhoods. But I can tell you also, as the officer will tell you, that some of the problems that we saw that were just academic and, and limited inside of the economically challenged neighborhoods is starting to come into the middle class. It, when I'm talking about economic middle class, kids are, are, are falling into that trap. So we've got to do a cultural shift. But our nation government, starting at the White House, they need to start leading that effort that something's wrong here. We've got to fix this. And we need to invest in that human capital. Uh, my name is Keith Coyley, and I would uh, like to ask you concerning leadership. How much of a factor with uh, all the difficulties that we have in our society right now um, are contributed to lack of male leadership uh, in the household? And okay. what do you think uh, would need to be done to change that? Well, my uh, opinion... I think it has a lot to do with uh, some of the systemic problems we have in our community. Uh, there is data that's taken by the Children's Defense Fund and by the Gallup organization that show kids, young men in particular, growing up in single family households, in poor neighborhoods. Uh, they have over a 50% chance to have an encounter with the law before they're 14 years old. The data is there. It shows that. So, just like we took on smoking, we got to take this on. Just like we took on AIDS in our lifetime, we got to take this on. Because again, our nation is not broke, but it's bent. Because when those kids, they will grow up to be takers, not givers. They're going to end up being uh, loaners, donor, not donors. And the sad thing is they may create kids of the same values that they came from. So uh, I do think a beginning is to talk about it. And then to start looking at substantive changes in our neighborhoods. And it's not all on the teacher's back. But you know what? The teachers can make a big difference if they have enough resources. And that we go to year-round school. And that those schools go from being a school to being a boys and girls club uh, after school. And that we go from volunteers to putting enough teachers in there. Because until we make that that shift is going to take a generation to get those daddies back into the house. 
to get that, that, those males to be back in the house. But we're not going to get there without talking about it to our own kids and grandkids and family members. And then we've got to show the impact because the data is there. But when was the last time you saw something on television talking about it? What is the television consumed with for the last four or five days, three or four days? Some dude in South Africa who killed his girlfriend. Last week just spent three damn days talking about people on a cruise ship. You swear to God this country ain't had no problems. Talking about people on a cruise ship. I mean that's what, we, that's what they spent their time on. And I do think we've got to try to control that narrative in that space where we are. And then we've got to demand that from our leadership that they take these issues on. Because you know what? Another thing that's shown by data is that people want three things. They want a safe community. They want to be able to take care of their families, have safe food, uh, have food security, and have a safe shelter. Regardless of where they live in the world, regardless of the economic, we've got to provide that. And one of that things that you ought not be worried about going home tonight. You ought not be worried about the security of your neighborhood. But you know what? Your neighborhood is not going to be secured unless we can fix this problem with the youth. Because your, your, your neighborhood will not be secured. Because it's some kid that didn't learn to read who becomes disengaged from school and become a part of the street uh, culture. We got to fix that. Too many people have sacrificed too much for this nation. For us to be where we are today. To allow our streets to be taken, taken over by kids who are not raised right. Let me, uh, we've got time for one more question. General Henri, it's my pleasure, and Colonel uh, Scott, it's truly a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to talk to you. My question is more of a comment and, uh, to you uh, and a solution. Uh, I firmly believe that I have a, my name is Zimariah Todd. I have a not-for-profit corporation called Futures. And what, we, what I've been working on is a vision and a plan for the last six years. Uh, we have an emerging new economy in renewable energy. And I think that's something that we have not really looked at as being a, a job maker. I think the President in his uh, State of the Union address made mention of it last week. I have a, my plan deals with uh, a program model called the Urban Sustainable Community. I'm looking at the west or either the south side of Chicago as a pilot project. And Colonel, I would love to talk to you about this later uh, whenever you get the time at, at your convenience. But what, is, what I'm talking about is, is, and what we're all talking about is such a profound question that has, a, has to have a profound answer to it. And I have also in my corporation what I call the African American uh, Baby Boomers and Grands or Grandparents Program. Because in, there's an old biblical saying that goes, people perish for lack of knowledge. I think there are two words missing out of that. People perish for lack of understanding, knowledge, and wisdom. And I think our leadership today is missing the wisdom and the understanding to the problems. Well, my question is, like I said, based on a, a comment, and it's asking for support for this urban sustainable community. And if I can get that kind of support and, uh, from you guys here, the director, Hit Richardson, I would love to talk with you about that. Thank you. OK. Outstanding. Good luck. You've been a great audience. Uh, General, do you have any final comments you'd like to make? Yeah, look, uh, let's, it's, uh, the sky is not falling. We're still the greatest nation in the world. And uh, there's a lot said about debt, but as I tell college students when I go around the world, I do not feel sorry for you because you got to, to pay a damn college loan back. There's no buses there waiting to take you off the war. And oh, by the way, that brand new car your mama and your daddy sent you to school with, remember that. So I don't feel sorry for you. And we will overcome this too. But in the process of overcoming the challenges of our nation today, 
uh, we've got to spend time in our communities to make sure this next generation of kids, not all of them, not all the kids are having challenge, but the ones that are is having an impact in the security of our communities. And people ought not be moving because it's the community that they grew up and lived in is no longer secure because kids are running amok shooting at each other. That should damn stop in America. And we need to stop it now. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you, for a wonderful, wonderful program. And thank you, uh, General Honoré, for being here this evening and blessing our project this way. I just want to say we do have surveys that we need to have filled out uh, because this is a grant-funded project. So if everyone would fill out the survey that's being handed out now, I would appreciate it. The other thing I want to emphasize, I, this little book, it looks little, but it's big inside. And I want to end by one of the um, jewels in the book. If General Washington had MSNBC in one ear and Fox News in the other, he never would have won the war. Our national conversation today isn't about the things that matter. We talk about freedom, but not responsibility. We talk about patriotism, but not real patriotism. Uh, uh, Real patriotism, genuine patriotism is a community activity. Patri patriotism takes something from us because we owe something to ourselves, to the people who came before us, and to those who will come after us. Do General Honoré, thank you so much for your life. Round of applause to this wonderful lady that has yes. provided this program and service to our community, Julianne Ritchie. Thank you. Thank you. And Paul, you know it's always a pleasure to be back with the Big Red One. Cool. Duty first. Duty first. Duty first. Hey, how you doing? First tank. Good to see you. Okay. Yes. Your last final year. Good to see you. Oh, great. Outstanding. Outstanding. Yes. Good to 